What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. Lord, we thank you for what a, what a beautiful day you've given us. And Lord, what an amazing thing it is that two or three can come together and you promise to be there. And it's where we choose to come together that you show up. And Lord, that's amazing that you come and grace us with your presence, your power, your peace. And we get to fellowship around you and with you and for you. So we ask today that you would open your word to us, that you would speak to our hearts, that your word would always be the center of why we gather to hear from you and to feed on you and recognize that you're the word of life and that we get to participate in that. So Lord, speak to us today and help us to have our hearts wide open to hear what you would whisper what you would say loudly or whatever way you which you choose to speak to us. So bless this time, I ask, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Philippians. Yeah, it, was, it was 38 years ago today that... Um, my wife and I, of fear and trembling, stepped into the Oriel Beach Elementary School to, to start New Life Christian Fellowship. Uh, we had no idea what the Lord would do, but we did know that the Lord had guided us and directed us to that step. He had made it very clear. He didn't make it real easy, but He made it very clear. And I can remember that very first service, they had had a open house at Oriole Beach Elementary School that Saturday, and so they had a bake sale and all kinds of stuff going on inside, so all the doors had been left open, it was a beautiful fall weather like this, and Sunday when I went in there, to, to, we had set up that night before in, in the cafetorium, I guess they called it, and it was filled with uh, Halloween stuff, like from the ceiling there was witches and goblins and... Uh, flies from the day before were flying around, you know, eating on crumbs. And I remember I had this little pulpit and I set it up and I, there was about 20 people there. And most of those were my family, my moms and cousins and friends. And I remember getting up to speak, had a guy with a guitar leading. Very first message, very first Sunday. And I, and I stood there at the pulpit and I looked up and there was a witch right over me like, <laughs> I thought, this is a wonderful way to start a church. But the Lord's been faithful, and Lynn and I have been uh, blessed. I, you know, I, I never thought that I would uh, live out my life here in Pensacola, Gulf Breeze, even though I was born here. When I was about 17, I remember my brother Yancey and I, he was about three years older than me, two and a half more accurately probably. Uh, it was during the time of the Vietnam War. That was the era when we were that age. And there was a draft, and it was on a lotto system. It was done by numbers. Some of you guys will remember that. And we had decided that if, if our number got close at all, we're going to Australia. There, there's beaches, there's amazing surf. Uh, we're we're going to move there. And we always dreamed that even if that didn't happen, that we would make our way to Hawaii and get lost in the islands and just, you know, surf our, for our whole life. But then at the age of 18, I met the Lord. And all my priorities begin to, to change. And, and, and let me ask you a question. What are you looking for in life? Is it that big house on the water? Not, not, there's nothing really wrong with a big house on the water. If you want to give one away, I'll, I'll take it. I mean, 
I'll take a big house on the water. Is, is it living somewhere on an island, you know, where everything's beautiful? Is it a new job? Is it being married to a handsome, rich man, if, if you're a woman? Is it some gorgeous, beautiful babe wife? I mean, the new car, the, the, the family, what is it that you're looking for? The, the Apostle Paul had his eyes on a, on a reality, and he, and he brings it to our attention here in these verses. I want you to look with me at chapter 3, verse 17. He starts off by saying something interesting. He says, brethren, join in following my example. Join in following my example. Now, now there's all kinds of examples in life, especially today. Notice how many there are out there. There's the examples of those who call themselves life coaches. Have you seen those people? They're just everywhere, all over social media. And, and most of them want to tell you how to live life and how to be successful. And you can pay them. They'll coach you to be this kind of person. They're your example. There's, there's, there's financial guru examples. They're, they're everywhere. You know, they'll show you how to invest in real estate or, or put your money in certain markets and you can become successful and financially well off. There's examples of, these are, these are every, cooking shows. You ever see these examples? They're going to turn you into a gourmet cook. And you can make all, uh, we, we were watching something, Lynn and I were just out of town before we were watching this one cooking show. It was all about Thanksgiving. And Lynn goes, there's no way I'm doing all that. I mean, it was just all this stuff. There's fitness shows and equipment. There's the Pelotoni. Maybe you're one of them. You got your screen and you're going for it and they're yelling at you and you can make it. There, there's HGTV example people where you could renovate. And I don't understand how they take this house and it's like a shambles in for $35,000. They renovated the whole thing. You're like... I can't even get curtains for, for $35,000. How do they pull this off? So, so there's like these tons of examples. But Paul says here, follow my example. Now he had said previously in this book of Philippians that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, that he was born into the line of King Saul. In fact, Neil shared with us that was his name to begin with, Paul. He was a scholar, trained by the best of his day. He was an elite member of the Jewish leadership. But that's not the example he wants us to follow. He left all that behind. He, he, he left his heritage. He left his people. All of his accomplishments he put behind himself. And now, Paul's despised by those who once adored him. Those who once looked up to him. As a follower of Jesus, they, they looked at him as, as someone who had abandoned his faith, following a, a crucified peasant. And not only that, at this time in this writing, Paul's also a prisoner of the Roman Empire. And here in verse 17, he says to you, to me, to those in Philippi, hey, follow my example. And you stop and you go, are you crazy? You're in prison. You're destitute. You're possibly facing execution. But Paul says, hey, follow my example. It's great. It's joyful. And if you go back just for a moment to chapter 3, there's a couple of verses I want to read. And I think this is where Paul is saying, this is what I want you to follow. Not being in prison, not being destitute, not being an outcast, but... It says in chapter 3, verse 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I'm not perfect. I haven't reached the, you know, the whole deal. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, this is the example I want you to follow. This is what I want to encourage you to do. To forget the old life, the way you once were. And to 
follow my example. He says, I left behind uh, self-righteousness, thinking that, you know, because of all the things I had accomplished in my Jewish faith, that I was somebody. I left behind legalism, keeping the rules and the regulations. Uh, I, I left behind, if we, could, if we could kind of put it in our vernacular day, I left behind playing church. No longer strutting around like I was somebody, uh, uh, look at me, I'm a leader. He said, I left that behind. All to walk out a real relationship with Jesus Christ. See, let me have your attention. Listen for just a moment. We are called, like Paul's example, to leave behind that old life and to come into a new life and find our joy and purpose and hope in Jesus Christ. Paul says, join me in this amazing journey. Join in, in my example. You'll never be disappointed. And he goes on to say there in verse 17, and, not only join in following my example, but note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. He goes, not just my example, but others who are living out a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Others who've left behind the old life. Others who are pursuing Jesus. He goes, follow mine and follow theirs. Now, you might say, well, I don't, I don't need Paul or, or some leader or some teacher. I'm not following a person or a pastor or a mentor. I'm following Jesus. Well, here's the deal. Biblically and practically, Paul knows and Jesus knows we need examples. And not only do we need examples, but listen, you and I need to be examples. I need examples. I need people that I can look to and say, you know what, there's somebody who's truly living the Christian. I don't need a bunch of bad examples. I can do that myself. I need some good examples. I'll never forget when I started surfing at 13 years of age. My brother and I, we kind of got into it and really dove into it, so to speak, here in, in this area. And the, the, there was, it was hard. I mean, I, I couldn't figure it out. First, first, first thing, here's, here's a quick surfing lesson, okay? First, you have to learn how to paddle. You've got to center yourself. You can't hang off the back. of the, if, if someone paddles out and they're hanging off the back of the board and their legs are way back there in the pound, you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know how to surf. You've got to center yourself on the board where you can paddle properly. The next thing you have to do is learn how to catch a wave. And it's not that easy. And then once you catch it, you've got to stand up on this board that's going down this way. And then once you hit the bottom of the way, you've got to learn how to turn that thing. It's kind of like, I figured out, it's kind of like driving a stick shift. If you ever remember that. Like, remember those cars? You had to shift gears? Well, that's what it's, surfing's kind of like that because you've got to learn how to push in the clutch shift, take your foot off the clutch, and, and keep going, and then do it again. And, and surfing's like, once you learn how to paddle, once you learn how to catch a wave and stand up, it all becomes just like shifting. You, you do it all in one motion. You paddle, turn around, catch a wave, and all, and all of a sudden you stand up, you turn. You don't even have to think about it for a while, just like shifting a, 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 a gear shift. But you have to watch people. There's examples out in the water, and you sit there and you go, oh, that's, look how that guy, he, he turns around, two strokes, he's in the wave. And you begin to watch people. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, moving to Delaware at 16, my mom was so excited to see me drop out of high school and go live in a surf shop. <laughs> and there I began to learn how to surf better and at 17, I took my first trip to San Diego, and wow, I mean, that opened up a whole new example for me of surfing. There are some of the best surfers in the world living in, in San Diego, Southern California, and I began to, to develop this mindset of people who were examples to me. There was this one guy where we were staying for the summer in Pacific Beach named Skip Fry. 
a world-renowned surfer, and just the smoothest surfer. He, his, his, his emblem on his boards were seagull wings because he would just kind of float through the surf. I'd just sit on the beach sometimes and watch Skip. And I'd watch surf movies. Guys, famous surfers like Nat Young. And it, it really helped me just to watch these guys and see how they performed. And then at 18 years of age, I got saved. And my my perspective began to change. Like, wait a minute, John. It's not just about you. It's not just about surfing. Went back to high school and off to Bible college when I finished high school. And never forget, I, um, I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So I had a guitar. And I remember I, I, I figured out a few, few chords, a few notes, but the only song I ever learned how to play was House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> I see you know that song. So, but you could sing, sing it to Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You know, you can sing any song to that tune. But, but I never could get the guitar down, but I practiced all the time. And, you know, your fingers get kind of callousy, and, and everyone thought I could play the guitar because I was always in my room kind of learning how. And, and, and sometimes you'd sit out in the courtyard and just have your guitar. <laughs> and you were just a poser. <laughs> but people thought you could play. But I never learned how to play. I eventually sold the guitar. I also wanted to play the piano. When our, my kids were little, we bought a piano, Lynn and I, and we put it in our, in our den, our living room. Our kids took piano lessons. I, I tried to play, and, 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 and <clears throat> I, I just never could. I, I, I love music, but just don't have any, any ability to, to, to do music. I needed a teacher. If I really was serious about playing the piano, I should have taken lessons, and the same with guitar, but it's the same in following Jesus. In your life, in my life, we don't, we don't do this by ourselves. We need others. I'll never forget when we first started the church, I had a good friend named Chris who helped me establish small groups. He, he played guitar. He was just this amazing individual, and two years into establishing of the church we had just poured the foundation for this building over here and he died of cancer the first funeral I ever did he lived four do- doors down from me in this neighborhood in Tiger Point we saw each other almost every day and when he got cancer I was I was um, I was in shock I thought he's 30 years old he'll be fine he had three kids at that time I go visit him in the hospital And to this day, he has been one of the greatest examples for me of what it means to trust the Lord in the midst of difficult times. I'd go to his hospital room and and we'd talk and and he would ask me, how's the church doing? I'd say, oh, Chris, don't worry about the church. How are you? No, no, what's the Lord doing? And and, and he would would say things to me like this, you know, if the Lord doesn't heal me, if he saves my sister and my, my, my mom and our, or one of my family members, it'll all be worth it, John. It'll all be worth it. And I'd walk out of that hospital room and just feel like I was about this big in my faith, and he was this giant. And he was such an example of trusting the Lord. And his sister did get saved in the, in the waiting room there at the hospital. And it was just phenomenal. If you're going to play great music, if you're going to surf really good, or whatever it is that you want to do, I mean, you need help. You need people, examples. Obviously, you need the Lord. But but we're all unique and gifted individuals. And, And Paul is setting this amazing, important principle for being connected to others. He says, follow my example. And those others who are doing it right... And, and, and you be an example that can impact others with a godly life. Boy, if we ever needed good examples, it's today. 
I mean, that's why there's four Gospels. All these different guys who wrote these Gospels were, were followers of Jesus, but they all were different. And they, and they gave us a picture of Jesus based on their own unique personality and the way they saw him. You know, Matthew, if you, if you understand the Gospel of Matthew, he really pictures Jesus as the sovereign king. That's who he is. Then you, you look at Mark. He gives a whole different perspective. His example of Jesus is the servant. I mean, you read the Gospel of Mark, and it's all action. You know, Jesus is doing some kind of service, some kind of healing, some kind of caring, chapter after chapter. And that's what Mark saw. He saw a servant. Matthew saw a king. Luke gives us this Savior for all mankind. And then John. John sees him as the great I am, the Son of God, the Creator, the Word of God becomes flesh. And we've got these four different men who, who, who give us these examples through their life of who Jesus is. All different men, all different expressions. And we all work out our own salvation. And we all are examples of Jesus Christ, good or bad with our own unique expression. But the goal, the purpose, like, like the Apostle Paul said, is to know Him, to follow Him, and to represent Him rightly. In, in chapter 3, verse 10 of, of Philippians, it says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. That's the goal, to know the Lord and to follow Him and to serve Him. Paul shows us here in our text today that following Jesus involves other people. It just does. I mean, they have their part. That God wants to use others in your life. It's His plan. It's His path. It's His purpose. But He uses people. I, I wasn't born a Jew I didn't study under a Jewish scholar. I, I didn't, you know, keep Jewish law. I, I wasn't even really brought up in the church. Church for me as, as a young person was something that was kind of over there. It was on the sidelines. I mean, I knew a little bit about church, but I, I didn't go there. But it's the same Jesus that calls the unchurched as well as the churched and he says, come on, follow me. Open your heart. Open your life. Find your joy. Find your purpose in me, he says. Follow me. And we look, we see, we're impacted by the lives of others. And that's why it's important to be connected to a church. That's why the scriptures over and over again say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's why it's important to be in a small group. We, we see how Jesus is lived out in each other's lives. And that gives support, that gives help, that gives strength. We're all walking out this faith. And we're all examples. See, I, I need to see real believers in my life. I want to be able to point to people and go, yeah, well, I know that person loves the Lord. I know they're not pretending. They're the real deal. Because there are some, as you know, and I know, bad examples out there. You ever seen any? Paul talks about that in this passage. Look what he says. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. That, that's a powerful verse. For many walk of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. The mind, which is the battlefield, is not set on Christ. For, for those who are... Bad. It's not set on Him. It's not set on the hope of His coming. It's not set on eternal things. 
It's set on self. And, and the reason Paul weeps, he says, and you don't ever hardly see Paul talking about weeping anywhere in the Scripture, but here. He says, I'm weeping for those, and I believe he's talking about those who are posers. Acting like one thing, but living like another. Paul weeps because what seems inferred is people are claiming to be followers of Christ, professing to be believers, but they're horrible examples. They're not really living it. Paul's letters are filled with warnings about those who claim one thing and live another. Here he says, you can't embrace the cross. You can't embrace the cross, which is dying to self and dying to the old life and continue to live for self and continue to live the old life. That's not possible. You can't pick up the cross and continue the old life. So an enemy of the cross is one who gives a false message, a phony example of one who takes up the cross to follow Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. Look what Paul says. Brethren, join in my example. Note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you, and now tell you even weeping, they're enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says it this way, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, they're posers, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, Many will say, hey, in that day, Lord, I prophesied, I cast out demons, I, I did all this stuff. And he says, I will declare to them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You say one thing, but your, your practice is lawlessness. Jesus calls them those who practice Things they should be ashamed of. It's very close to what Paul calls those in Philippi, that they serve fleshly desires, not the Lord. It's, it's serving your, your appetite, serving your desires, what's, what's just pleasing to you. And, and it goes on to say here in this, this passage that it should be, that they take glory in what should be something they're ashamed of, but they're proud of it. Now, now, please listen. I think I tried to say this earlier. Nothing wrong with money, if it's used correctly. Nothing wrong with pleasure. Nothing wrong with a nice house. Nothing wrong with having a decent living. Th th these things are not bad. But if it becomes your glory, if that's what makes you significant, if, if, if that's your driving purpose in life, if, if, if you're all about, and, and you'll sac I'll sacrifice my family, I'll sacrifice my marriage, my faith, my friends, my church, my calling, my testimony, to have those things. Well, the Lord says, shame on you. You may call me a Lord, but I don't really know you. You become an enemy of the cross, a follower of of self, you have a different calling. In fact, Paul goes on to tell us in verse 20, here's our calling. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of what he said in chapter 1, verse 27. It's, it's very similar. Paul kind of repeats himself again. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come to you or I'm absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He says, let me hear that example. Let me hear that you're living that way, that your identity is in Christ, you're changed, 
So, so he says, live that way because we're eagerly waiting his return. Let me hear that you've left the old life, like 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I love this verse. It says, if anyone in the Christ sees a new creature, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you know what I say about that passage? Thank God that's true. That that can happen. You don't have to stay in the old life. The, the, the Philippians, although they're 800 miles away from Rome, the emperor had, had gifted them and given them the ability and the privilege and the right to be Roman citizens. And this was a huge thing. They had opportunities that those without this citizenship could never have. They had the protection of the Roman army. And they, listen, the Roman army, those were some bad dudes. They had their protection as a citizen. They had the privilege to own property. They had the privilege of, of, of voting, actually, and having lawful marriages. Paul's saying there's a higher citizenship, though. You're, you're, you're not just a citizen of Rome. He says, you're, you're a citizen of heaven. And guess who protects you? Not the Rome, not the Romans, but God Himself. I mean, how much more capable is God than, a, than the army of Rome? God, and, and, and you don't just own property, you have eternal residence in heaven. And you have the ability to be the bride of Christ. See, we're citizens of heaven. And forever will be, keep our perspective on this, we need to be reminded over and over again, that we are his ambassadors here on this planet. So Paul is saying, I want you to be an example of that. I want you to understand that you have a heavenly calling. I want you to remember that your sins are forgiven. Rome can't forgive your sins. That you're free of guilt and shame. That you have God's grace and his mercy and his faithfulness. That, that your citizenship in heaven is, is different than anything anyone else could possibly have. We're called not to live as Romans. Now, now please hear this. We're called to live as citizens of heaven, right? Not even so much as Americans. Because I would submit to you, the Americans are confused. They're confused about sex. They're confused about gender. They're confused about vaccines. How many know we're confused about vaccines? We're confused about marriage. We're confused about morality. But here's the thing, as a citizen of heaven, I get to live by God's truth, by His example, by those things that don't change based on who's in office or what the culture is telling me. Let me read this verse again. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's coming who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. We have some sure expectations. We have some solid truth. We have the expectation of his return and to be given a glorious new body like his. Uh, put me down for that. I'd be happy to. We all have this, you know, uh, one day immortal body. We, we were just on a little trip together, and uh, Neil and his family stopped by up in North Carolina where we were staying. And one of my granddaughters asked me this question. I don't, maybe this is just a question kids of that age ask. Said, Pop, what superpower would you like? A superpower? Hmm. A, a body that's indestructible. No need for lipo, tux, Botox, lifts. I mean, if you've had those things, that's fine. But I was giving a message once on, on immortality. And I said, one day, we will all be immoral. <laughs> Some guy in the back said, amen. <laughs> I meant to say immortal. That will live forever. Because, you know, here on earth, we don't live forever, right? <laughs> There's a funny story. So we're, we're on vacation for a week, and 
Ah, don't judge me on this. <laughs> and in my backyard, I, I always see these little holes, something's rooting around, and I've caught possums, I've caught raccoons, and I've, and I've relocated them down the highway. And a nice, pleasant park way down there that great for animals. So I left this trap there. I'd put a hot dog in it, and about three-fourths of it was gone before I left. And I'd forgotten about it. Nothing had gone in there forever. So I took off, and I got back late Friday. And yesterday, I'm out cleaning up the yard. You know, obviously, we'd had some wind while we were gone. And I walked past that trap. I'd forgotten all and there was a possum in there. I thought, whoa, there's a possum in there. So I went over, and I'm looking at him. He's just kind of laying on his side, and I thought, he's playing possum. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I give it a little kick, the cage, and I go, man, he's good. <laughs> Until I kicked the cage over, and he was so stiff, he just rolled over, and I thought, oh, my God, I starved the poor guy to death. He wasn't posing. He, he, he wasn't playing dead. He was dead. So I threw him over the fence. No, I didn't throw him over the fence. <laughs> but what, I say all that to say this. One day we'll never die. We'll live forever. We don't have to be posers. But Paul challenges us to be real followers of Jesus. I want to encourage you and me, sign up for that. We need that. We don't need people who are drunk all the time or, you know, cheating on their wives or, you know, involved in immorality. We need real followers. That's what Paul's saying. Leave the old life behind. Look at other. We, we need each other to be that. Recognize your true citizenship, where you're really headed and the hope that God has for you. That we'll see Him one day and be like Him. And, and, and let me steal one verse from, from next week. And I'll, I'll actually be sharing again next week. It says in chapter 4, Therefore, my beloved, and long for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord. And that's where he's headed. He says, this is our hope. This is our need. We need each other to be real. We, 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 we need to recognize that we're awaiting His return and that we have a, a citizenship that's not just here. And we need each other to follow the Lord. Stand fast, He says. And you can only stand fast if you're truly in the Lord. You can't stand fast otherwise. Stand fast in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. See, in this crazy culture, and it's crazy, where schools are falling apart, where government's out of control, where the media is just whacked, where chaos seems to be everywhere, if you don't know the Lord, you won't be able to stand fast. Stand fast in the Lord. And if you don't know the Lord, I'll close with this. What are you waiting for? A worldwide pandemic? What are you waiting for? Floods and natural disasters? What, what, what are you waiting for? Actually for North Korea to send a missile? What, what are you waiting for? When, when the Lord says, hey, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I can give you rest. I can give the ability to stand fast. I, I can make you a citizen of a kingdom that is without end, full of blessings and hope. And so the Lord would say to you, if you don't know Him today, come home. Come home to the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves you and gave Himself for you, and leave the old life behind, and come be a citizen of heaven.